Hello everyone and welcome to the video. So in last video, we wrote a small enterprise-ish application in F Sharp, which was basically FizzBuzz. And we did a live refactoring session to make sure the application was testable and it was modular and that all the units that were used were decoupled from the application so they can be unit testable and that the application itself can be component tested. In this video, we'll compare that F Sharp application we just wrote in the last video, and we'll compare it with a C Sharp implementation of the same program with the same requirements, but with an OOP paradigm. The goal of this video is to analyze both implementations of both paradigms and both languages and analyze the pros and cons of both approaches. As a disclaimer though, I do admit I'm a pretty big fan of the f -sharp programming language, so there might be a little bit of bias, although I will do my best to keep that in check and be 100% impartial. The goal is just to let the code speak for itself, uh, lay out the facts, and ultimately let you decide what you feel is the best technology to use for your own problems and which technology you want to learn and master. Also, the c -sharp implementation is 100% object-oriented. So even though c -sharp supports a little bit of functional programming like link queue and lambdas, which are both you know, passing functions around, uh, I'm not gonna use that in this video. This will be 100% object-oriented. Now, I do believe the implementation would have been better if I could have used lambdas, funks, and link queue overall, uh, maybe you no doubt if you use C Sharp day to day, you use a lot of those concepts. And if you permit my functional programming propaganda for a little second, if the implementation would be better using those techniques of passing functions around and building towards functions, maybe using a functional programming language would be better. Of course, even me, I would disagree with that last statement because just because a little bit of something is good doesn't mean a, a lot of it is better. Uh, so that argument isn't really good, but it does beg the question. It does beg the question whether using a different technology would be better if it supports and enables and encourages that kind of design. Now I will be going through the C Sharp implementation step by step explaining what I did. But if you want to follow along in the source code, you can go ahead and check out my link below for my GitHub repository. Uh, I'll include a repository for both the C Sharp implementation and the F Sharp implementation. Um, so that's about it for now. If you like this kind of content, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and like the video, it really helps me out. And so without further ado, let's jump in. All right, so let's jump into the C Sharp implementation. Uh, I made two implementations of the C Sharp uh, FizzBuzz like we did in last video. I did a, a first one, which is a, like a gorilla mode. We're just going to write it all in one function uh, version. And then I did a refactored version like we did the F sharp. So let's jump into the gorilla version. And fun fact, I actually spelled this gorilla instead of gorilla. Anyway, doesn't really matter. Uh, OK, I'm going to zoom this in. Now, this is everything is in the main, like we did in the last one. And so let's read this. We console write line, uh, enter a number, then we do console read line, then we try parse, and we do an early return, which is the first thing that, that we can say it's different. And we validate the number. If it's not valid, we return and we print out. That's great. Then this is the implementation of FizzBuzz itself. We can use a string builder here, which is you know a very it's a mutable version, but it's very high performance, so that's good. Uh, we do is replaced var is C style for loop for every number between one and number. Then we do modulo. If it's modulo of three, we append fizz. If it's five, we append buzz. And as both cases, we toggle this boolean. And this, if the boolean hasn't been toggled, we append a number. So this is kind of a clever way of. Uh, uh, appending fizz and buzz and not having to do this double check of, of modulo, but there's a thousand ways to skin this cat and I didn't really invest the time to <laughs> go through all of them. Then at the end we do the console write line of the string builder. So that is basically 
the C sharp, like very fast version of the FizzBuzz. And now I put side by side the F sharp and the C sharp implementation, just so we can get a few quick references of how we can compare these two. I actually don't have a problem with either of these two implementations. If you're going to do something fast and once, uh, I think both of these are fine. I, I think even the C-sharp implementation, yeah, it, there's a lot more lines of code, but a lot of those lines of code are, you know, are, are new lines and brackets and stuff. So to me, these two are pretty equivalent. Uh, I don't have a lot to say with the difference between these two. It, the, the, the true difference between those these two languages are not shown in their imperative form, in their imperative, imperative way of of writing code. It's more in the how we orchestrate large pieces of, of software and how the abstraction and the decoupling happens, which we'll see. So for now, I mean, th this is fine. You know, for something quick and easy, uh, I have no problem with this implementation. Of course, this part is mutable, but it's probably a little bit better in performance than this one. Uh, probably marginal but uh, it's still, yeah, it's still a, a little leg up. And uh, here notice in, in, F sh in C sharp, uh, or actually in both implementations, we early return here. So after this, this early returns, this returns unit and, and stops executing here too. But what you'll see is in the F sharp implementation in the long one, we don't, we can't really do early returns. In the error cases, we still execute branches. We still execute checks of, uh, is this okay or an error? Okay, it's an error, okay. I, is it okay or it's an error or, or whatever? So these are branches that are always executed. executed. Um, it's probably not a big deal performance-wise in the long run. It depends on what level of, of performance you're really going for. If it's really super performance critical, maybe using exceptions or, or something that can return early. Uh, can be better than using the result, but I don't believe in our case it's really a big deal. So that's one thing. So this basic implementation of both programs uh, I do feel is pretty equivalent. I mean, of course, I prefer this syntax. I prefer the conciseness. I, I like the structure a lot better. This is kind of if, uh, if else, if else, it's kind of enters loops like here, like here, yes, we're, we're looping here. You know, this is a range and we're mapping across the data, but I'm not going reading up and down. I'm always reading top to bottom, left to right. And that's, that's really enjoyable. Here we're, we're looping, things are changing, like this replace is changing. I'm not sure if it's true or false. At, well, of course I can figure it out, but it's not totally immediately apparent to me. So, these are, are the downsides. So downside to this is the mutability and immutability impairs reading and uh, the looping also impairs exactly what it's doing versus having the higher order functions. To me, it's a lot easier to visualize what the data is doing or how the data is changing and the, the order of reading. So the top to bottom, left to right, which is very important to me. Now let's look at uh, the C-sharp implementation of the refactored version of the application. All right, so I'm here at the, in the C-sharp application. And the first thing I want to make a comment on is the size of the project. So this does exactly the same thing as our F-sharp equivalent in that it has all the domain logic and it has the application structure and it has the abstracted uh, input and output mechanism. So that's great, but you see there's a lot of folders here and that's, this is idiomatic uh, in terms of how we separate um, our, our classes and our interfaces. So normally in C-sharp, uh, interfaces and classes are in their own files. Uh, this can differ depending on your own company's conventions. For example, when I used to work at Genetech, we just put it in the same file. It didn't really matter a lot to us. Um, that's one thing. It made it easier to find stuff, so that's one thing. Uh, but for coding conventions, this is pretty much how it is. Uh, 
and we have uh, folders to separate our namespaces. In, in F Sharp, we separate namespaces with uh, modules, especially. Uh, we do use other files. In my case, in the F Sharp implementation, I did not use the other files, but you could argue that the result module and the option module should have been put out. And maybe you want a module for each of those, the parser, the validation, and the fizzbuzz, but it's not really super enforced in F Sharp to do that. If it's a small, if it's a small thing, you, you ain't gonna use it sometimes. So just abstract it out if it's gonna be reused somewhere or if there's a logical reason why. Of course, if the file gets very large, it can defer, but you know, large files aren't that, they, they won't get very large in F-sharp because the code is that much more concise. So that's one thing. Now let's walk through how this all works. And you see, it, it's gonna take a lot more time for me to explain how this application works because the code is everywhere. It's everywhere and it's nowhere. It's, uh, it, you can't see what the order of the things are defined and what relies on what, because uh, the files, they, they don't have to be in sequence. So that's another thing, that the sequencing of the files is really apparent. Okay, now let's look at this application class, which would be the equivalent of the application uh, module in my F-sharp implementation. So we have an execute function, and this takes uh, input and output, and it also takes uh, these two things, domain workflow factory and exception handler. And there's a reason why we need this in this implementation, not in the other. I'll go through the execute method and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so the first thing we do in the execute method is we set the output like we do in the F sharp implementation. Then we get the input. Here we get the, so we create a workflow based on the input. And the reason why we have to do that is we, so in, in C sharp, we use exceptions to handle the error cases. And the exception handling is something different. It's something else that, that basically you surround a, a piece of code with. And based on that piece of code, you wanna catch a certain types of exceptions. So ideally what I would wanna do is here, I just want to pass this thing. I would want to give it a Lambda and it can do try catch around that Lambda and handle its cases appropriately. But for this challenge, I said I would do a 100% object oriented approach and I cannot use delegates, Lambdas or LinQ. So what I had to do is I had to create a workflow factory. I'm just gonna offer a little disclaimer here. I edited the next section and I realized it's actually incredibly confusing uh, there's going to be a lot of templates, a lot of template constraints, a lot of interfaces, a lot of craziness. Uh, don't worry about it if you're a little bit confused. If you're at your computer, you can always jump into the code if you want. Or basically what's happening is I'm basically re-implementing uh, what a Lambda actually is. So a Lambda, it's basically creating an object that has parameters injected and that has an invoke method. Um, basically doing the same pattern here, but the, the, the invoke method is called execute and um, that's basically the same principle. So we're doing that pattern in an object oriented way. Uh, there's a lot of interfaces, like I said, a lot of generics. Uh, just keep calm and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it in the next section. Back to you, past Ben. So if I go and I, uh is it F12? Yeah, F12. I have a domain workflow factory, which is a workflow factory of a domain workflow. So if I do a domain workflow, which is a, a workflow that takes a string, and, oh, sorry, returns a string. So basically the, the workflow we want to execute is an execute the, is a workflow that returns a string, which is the fizzbuzz workflow. It, it returns a string. I'm going to back. I'm actually super confused right now. Um, Hopefully this is big enough. Every time I go in a new file, I have to resize. Anyway, so if I go back here, a workflow factory is uh, an interface that its concrete type will have a create. So it's able to create a workflow. This is basically the factory pattern. Uh, most of you know this. 
So based on my input, I create a T workflow. T workflow is a workflow, I, I showed you this. So let's look at the concrete implementation of domain workflow. Basically I inject the domain and the input and my execute function is basically the aggregation of the, the result and the string. So the reason why I have to do this is because I have to have an object that has a, a method that takes no parameters and returns a string for my exception handler. And my iWorkflow exception handler is tWorkflow and I can probably be cost variant or whatever. You can do this, it doesn't change much. But So this iWorkflow exception handler inherits from, uh, it doesn't inherit from anything. It has a tWorkflow where tWorkflow uh, inherits from iWorkflow and it takes a workflow and it handles it to return whatever it returns. And by handling it, it handles its exceptions. So it returns data based on, its, uh, based on its exception. So if we look at the concrete implementation of that, we have handle workflow.execute, and then we try catch the error cases and give you, if you recognize these two error messages, these are the error messages we previously talked about. And the exceptions themselves are also in here. This is an invalid number exception and this is a not a number exception. All right, so we went through a lot of classes and it's actually very easy to be confused if I'm honest, but at the same time, if I'm also honest, it wouldn't be this complicated if I could use lambdas or link you, or not link you in this case, just lambdas. Lambdas in this case would cut like the, the factory pattern that we had to use and all those interfaces because we just use a function signature as, a, as an abstraction. Now, the, the fact that we couldn't pass a, a function that takes no parameters and returns a string here causes us to create this factory. So a lot of it could have been avoided here. Anyways, enough rambling. So I handle the exception and I get a result and I set the output to that result. Okay. So that's the top level, that's the orchestration of, of the, the domain and, and its dependencies. If we look at domain here, you see the, these are the three modules. These are the three units that we have. They all have interfaces because um, we, want the, we want the domain to be decoupled with each of these modules because we don't want it to be tied to the implementation like we said in our requirements video, in, my, in, the, in, the, in the last video, the, the requirements of the project. And we have an execute function that takes an input, which is the, the, the this is basically uh, without the console and without the error messages, this is our workflow. So we take the input and if we can't parse, we throw a not a number exception if the number is not valid, we throw an invalid number exception and we give that parsed int to get fizzbuzz. Now I'm going to jump right into that get fizzbuzz, which is here. You see, this takes a number and in our F-sharp implementation, it takes a valid number, which is a single case discriminated union that we created with a private constructor. And we could do this in in C sharp, but it'll create so much more overload of a thing. We have to create a new class and it has to have a certain methods and it has to have validation in that. And uh, how can I say it? First, it's not idiomatic. And the fact that in C sharp, it's basically a one liner and two functions. Uh, in C sharp, it's a lot more verbose and it will be a lot more work to do. So it's generally not done. It's just a more more reasonable or more. It's it's easier for the column to just do uh, check the arguments here and throw new argument exceptions uh, if things are not up to what or things are not what they are expected to be. So that's a, a key difference between the two implementations. Okay, let's go over the two other uh, units now. So the parser. Pretty standard implementation has an I parser interface. All of these uh, units have interfaces and a validator. Whoop, nope. 
and this validator is valid returns this. So this returns a, a bool. It does not return a valid number like in our other implementation. Okay, now we have IO, which is the interface for the input and the output. We have get and we have input here in different files. In IOC, we have the application factory because we can't do we can't partially apply the the um, the input and the output to the function. We have to create a factory that takes an input and the output and returns a new instance of the application. So here's a clear uh, example of how partial application is very powerful to to inject dependencies. Basically, uh, dependency injection in object-oriented relies on the factory pattern and the builder pattern. Well, well, the builder pattern. It will also rely on the builder pattern in, in F-sharp if we need that. In this case, we don't need a builder pattern. So we, we don't use it. But the factory pattern, which if you've ever written large pieces of software, a lot of your code is just factories and, and injecting stuff in. It can be a very big piece of, of work, like factories and factories and factories. And uh, that's, of course, if you're not using some IOC container like, uh, like Unity or um, you, you basically rely on an IOC container for all, your, all, all those dependencies. For me, I, I personally don't like working with uh, those kinds of IOC containers. I prefer to see how things are instantiated and have complete control over the, the, uh, the disposal of each object because you know, in, in object oriented, you're using a lot of the dispose pattern. So it's, you know, with Unity, it doesn't really control the order of, of uh, in which, uh, the order in which disposes are, are made, which can be a big problem as well. So that's, that's uh, IOC containers and, and dependency injection. If you go here, we have a domain factory, which is basically instantiating the parser, the validator, the fizzbuzz, and, and injecting it to the domain. And this is used in the factory here. So we have a domain factory, domain workflow factory, and a domain exception handler here, and we're injecting it to the application. Uh, and that's how, if we go here, and we're just gonna lapse a bunch of things. And once we create this application, we can give it to the CLI. And the CLI will have two implementations of the input. It will have the console input, which is console read line. And it'll have the console output, which is console write line. And uh, we can give it to the program here. So the program creates the application factory. It creates input and output. It passes the input and output to the application factory. And then it gets, gets an application. And then you can do execute. OK. So we had a brief chance to look at the implementation. From that implementation, what conclusions can't we draw from the comparison between the two? Now to refresh your memory, if maybe you haven't checked out last video, uh, let's look at the F# -sharp implementation now. Uh, you can skip this. I haven't changed anything from when I wrote it from last video. So if you maybe you're looking at both videos consecutively, you might want to skip. But uh, I'm going to do it pretty quickly. So here, these are two uh, helper modules that we wrote for the option and result type just to convert uh, a try tuple to an option and an option to a result. And here, this is our parser module here. So we try parse and we convert it to an option. This is our validator module, which we create a private, uh, we create a type called valid number and we give it a private constructor. The private constructor to control who can instantiate that object to give us a lot more control and assurance that when I get a valid number in, in uh, let's say as a parameter, I am 100% certain that it passed the validation rules. We don't have to revalidate the arguments. We don't have to throw argument exceptions. It's just there and it's good to go. So we have is valid number and we return some valid number if it's valid. And we have this value function to extract the inner property, which in this case is number, because we have a private constructor. And when the constructor is private, the deconstructor is also private. So that's a bit of a downside, but uh, it gives us a lot of upside. So that's that. For the FizzBuzz module, uh, 
we go ahead and we have a get Fizzbuzz string. So this is basically our algorithm, our, our, our Fizzbuzz like program, if you want. And it takes a valid number and the, we extract the value of the valid number with the value uh, function, which is this. So we get one to that number. Then we map for every, um, for every number, we get the module of three, module of five. And we do some pattern matching based on the result of that to make sure if it's a, a factor of 15 or if, if 15 is a factor of that number, if three is a factor of that number or if five is a factor of that number, then if it's not, then we convert it into a string and we concatenate all strings with the new line separator. Uh, in our domain, we identified all our types, all our, our types of functions. So the parse number function, and this is basically the equivalent of interfaces if you want. There are one line interfaces or interfaces of one function. We have a parse number interface, which is uh, it takes a string and uh, converts it and, and returns an it option. Uh, we have a validate number which takes, a, which takes an int and returns a valid number option. So it can be a valid number or not. We have a get fizzbuzz string, which takes a valid number and turns a string. So this one is a pure, uh, well, all of, them, all of these are pure, but it is uh, always going to pass. It, it's not, it doesn't return an option or anything. We define the two types of errors. There's a, and these can be seen as the equivalent to exceptions, if you want. So we have a type of error that's uh, all the errors that parsers can return, which in this case, there's one and it's called not a number and it takes an int. There's the validator, validator error and there's one case of that also and it's invalid number, which takes an int. Did I say non number takes an int? Non number takes a string. I'm not sure if I uh, mistaked my words. Okay, and then this error type, which is in the domain module, so that's how it's separated. We have error is either a parser error or it's a validator error which are the, the two possible errors in our, in our workflow. And we define the type for our entire workflow, which is it takes a string from the input and returns a result of, it's either the fizz, it will either return the fizzbuzz string or it will return an error that we previously defined just here. Now our execute function, this is the domain, like in our domain, we have an execute function and it will return a uh, it will be defined as a function that takes uh, the that that has this signature, and for this we shadow defined our parser number, just so it can be combinable with uh, the rest of the workflow. So to be combinable, it has to have the same type signature, and for now the parse number had as a signature it, it took option, it, it returned an option, and we wanted to return a result of string or or a result of, in this case, it's int and a domain error. So we, from that option, we mapped it to a parser error. And from that parser error, we mapped it to a, an error. And we did the same thing for validate number. So both of these are pretty similar, but they have different, uh, different error cases and different union construction, union cases or union constructors and all this. So this execute function returns a function that takes an input. So these are my dependencies that I injected and it returns a function. So this function takes an input, it parses the number. Then if it's successful, it validates. And then whether or not it validates or if only, only if it's valid, it will get the parse, the, the fizzbuzz string. Now in our application level, we define two types, our input and output, we take, which basically are I input and I output in the OOP implementation. And we have an execute function that basically applies um, or injects, if you want, the domain, the domain function with the three units that we defined. The, so the, the parser unit, the validate unit, and the fizzbuzz unit. So this is much like the domain factory, if you want with this domain, or this is calling the domain factory. This one is basically the domain factory, if you want. Um, this being the final product. Once we defined our execute function that's been injected, we can give it to the application, 
in the applications case, we have an input and an output as dependencies. And this will return a function that takes unit and it will output this number. Then we'll get the input from the user. We will execute our logic. And based on the result of that, we will do pattern matching and associate or not associate. We will determine what the output to uh, the out, the <laughs> what string to give to the output, depending on what case it is. So if it's okay, we are gonna say, here's the output and put the output. If it's an error, sorry, it's a partial error, that's not a number, we're gonna give it this string. And if it's a validator error, that's an invalid number, we're gonna give it this string. And actually I have three times, you know, the, the output pipe, so I can actually go ahead and do this, you know, as a baby refactor, and I can pipe it into output in all cases. So that's a small, small win there. Um, great. So that's our whole application. So it's about uh, 109 lines of code. Um, and it's one file. So you can see how that creates a big clash uh, in the C Sharp implementation where there's a lot of files, a lot of stuff all over the place. Uh, in general, there's more lines of code and it's a lot harder to follow the flow of the actual application because there's no order there's no file order or de uh, declaration order. Okay. All right, I am back. And I basically compiled a list of pros and cons in a file. And we're gonna walk through that file and we're gonna talk about it together. So line by line at first, the first thing I wanna mention is a disclaimer that uh, I avoided the use of link queue and delegates and Lambda expressions and it would have been a lot better if I used those tools and it would have been less of a joke, like a complete joke, the, uh, the C sharp implementation, because I feel it was very, um, it was actually very painful to do, to be honest. Um, but you know, I, I, have, I wrote C sharp for, for, I have like at least three to four years of, of writing C sharp and, uh, it's, you know, I use lambdas like lambdas all the time, uh, when writing C sharp. So don't like take it with a grain of salt, all of this, this implementation. Um, just keep that in mind that uh, doing 100% OOP is probably not a good idea. And also um, uh, you probably don't need, like if you don't need this level of extraction between all the components, you saw like the, we did a single method and it was job done, you know? So it really depends on, on your use case and um, you know, you should practice the uh, Yagni or you ain't going to need it a little bit of philosophy where you should only, you know, imagine the level of extensibility you need in the future for uh, reasons, you know, and you can always refactor you know, to, to make things better. Like you don't have to do everything perfect the first time or gold plate is another term. You don't have to gold plate everything. Just Imagine where not having extensibility would be a massive pain and make those areas extensible and make things you need to, to have extensible, extensible, make things you need to be testable, testable, uh, make things you need to be, you know, that's basically it and, and focus on those principles and you won't have to end up with a massive, massive interfaces like we just saw in the C-sharp implementation. So don't waste your time is, is a big key. You can always refactor um, slightly after, and I, I don't, I don't say just write crap code and when shit hits the fan, start refactoring. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying be very pragmatic and question yourself whether you need this level of of extraction and and very just like uh, like gold plating. So that that's one thing that's important to to start with, just to keep all of this in mind. Now let's start with the C sharp pros because there are a lot of pros to writing C sharp versus F sharp. Uh, the first one is the tooling is probably the, the best, like the, the best can be. Um, I used Visual Studio and ReSharper for like three years or something. And you know, with a lot of the refactoring commands that are available and uh, just the, the level of tooling that, that's available, it's probably one of the best development experiences you can have. And since a lot of the tooling for F-sharp 
uh, you know, it was very, you know, a while back it was growing and stuff. It wasn't perfect, and now it's getting a lot better. And I feel very comfortable in writer, but uh, you know, since a lot of the the stuff are open source and stuff, you can get issues. And since you know, Visual Studio and Writer, those are both paid products. Um, you'll get a, like a very good development experience. That's not to say uh, tooling in F Sharp is is bad or not good enough. I I personally really feel at home when I code uh, in F Sharp with the tooling. I don't feel uh, I I do feel there's some things I want. And I uh, mentioned these three refactoring commands that I would like added to uh, Writer, which is the inlining a variable. Which basically, if you define a, a local variable, but you only use it at one place, you can just uh, take the, the its its expression and just paste it where it was, where the other token was. That's one thing I would really like. Extract method, which is basically the same thing, and uh, extract variable. Um, well, actually, extract method is you highlight a piece of code and then you do you know control R R M and you can uh, create a method with that piece of code you highlighted which are the refactoring commands I feel were very powerful when I was writing C Sharp. Uh, made things a lot, a lot more fun. Uh, these are just a few. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like a massive JetBrains fanboy, just talking like great things about Rider and great things about Resharper, but that's it. I, I'm not affiliated. <laughs> um, second thing is the FizzBiz algorithm is probably a little bit more performant. Um, like very, very slightly, like super slightly. And that's to say that sometimes mutation is, uh, has advantages. In this case, probably, probably it doesn't have a lot of advantage. I, I, I checked the difference of performance between a string builder implementation and a string concat implementation. It was probably a factor of two, two or three uh, X. So it's basically negligible. It has the same, uh, it has the same complexity. So, um, but that's probably because string concat uses some string builder in, in, in behind the scenes, but it has a, a pure interface. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say that when you have a pure interface or, or a deterministic function, sometimes mutation uh, improves performance. And that's something that you just can't, we, we just can't let go of uh, in, in functional programming. But like I say, more performant, like, you know, a thousand one is more than a thousand. Like it, it's a bigger number, but that uh, relative change uh, is very minute. So when something is more performant, it doesn't necessarily mean we should go towards that. There's other factors that we should take into consideration when, when something is better. But like for video games and for performance critical stuff, uh, mutation is probably the way to go. Also, pros, uh, domain was still pure. I mean, we can have a pure domain if, uh, or a pure, a pure model, or, or we can have pure functions in C Sharp. Like, that can be done. You can program functionally in C Sharp. So that's also a pro. You don't have to change a new language uh, if you want to write functional code. That, that's completely true. Uh, you can early return when doing um, building workflows. So we like we used in F sharp, we use the result type and the result type in the error case, it will still check for every error, for every function call or every kind of building block you put, you still, even if it's an error and you're not gonna do anything with it, you still check whether it's a, a success or not. So that's for, for, every, for every function that you branch together, there's a branch there. There's an if statement behind the scenes that's being made whether, uh, and in the case of C Sharp, the fact that you can return early uh, makes it so there's a lot of code you're not executing in the error cases. And even though that might be a small performance advantage, it's still a performance advantage that we can, uh, we, we have to talk about, that we have to mention. But in F Sharp, you can always throw exceptions and you can get that, that same result. Well, it won't be the same result. It'll be the same result as throwing exceptions in C Sharp, but returning early, like returning unit early, uh, doesn't really happen. Um, or you have to write your, your code in a specific way. 
Um, like I said, you can still do pure and functional code in C Sharp. You can even implement the pipe operator with a, an extension method. Uh, you can try it yourself. I, when I used to work at Genetech, I, I wrote it and I used it everywhere and people found it annoying sometimes, but uh, uh, no, they, they don't find it annoying. They, you know, people, some people started embracing it, but you know, it's not everyone that uh, uses the pipe operator and it makes a lot more sense in F-sharp than in C-sharp, but uh, instead of writing, you know, variables between your, your function calls, you can write your own pipe operator. And with link queue, it works great. So you select, select, pipe, select, like where, like branching a lot of those link queue extension methods together to write really nice functional code. Now the cons. So there's a lot of cool things, but there's a lot of cons as well. So the solution structure, there is an insane amount of files if we follow those those C sharp conventions. The the fact that you have to have an interface that is a separate thing, like its function signature is not enough. We have to it has to be a thing somewhere and it has to be uh, in a different file. Uh, that's kind of annoying. Um, and having one thing per file, that's also annoying. So you can get like multiple files of one line instead of one line of multiple files. Um, and that's something we I really started embracing when I was when I started running F sharp. Um, I just feel it's a lot better. Uh, create an interface, yeah, like I said, it's very annoying for every abstraction instead of using its fun function signature. So that's a massive advantage of uh, F sharp. There is a lot of boilerplate. Uh, so I was refactoring this, and I just feel like. When I'm extracting stuff, there's a lot more stuff that needs to 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 disappear, like uh, constructors and and uh, you know, let's take an example domain here. You know, if I remove this, then I have to remove this, then I have to remove this, and then I have to remove everywhere. So it's kind of there's a lot of stuff that I need to modify, and that don't really do anything. Like, why do I need this if I'm <laughs> I'm basically always going to do private read only. Like, obviously not always, but most of the time, it's um, it's just a, a lot of stuff that you don't need, to be honest. If you do a more like F sharp or React, you know, if, if you do React, um, you create properties, and those properties are are kept in that in that constructor, and you can use them even outside of the constructor. You don't have to set them to a private member. So boilerplate must also change. So the boilerplate is like a magnification of the work you have to do. If you have to refactor uh, one line and there's you know two lines of boilerplate, then it has to go with it. Or not always, obviously, but in a lot of cases, it's a multiplicative multiplicative factor. The, the boilerplate. Um, like I said, the domain was pure, which is great. But although the domain is pure, I'm not reassured by the type system. So function calls always take the parentheses in C-sharp. I don't know if, if uh, values are, are pure or not. And sometimes if you use properties, you get fooled, and sometimes you get fooled the opposite way. So the, this tooling is not made to, to enforce purity or to encourage purity, which is a big problem if you're going to do functional programming in, in uh, C-sharp. Wrapper types are expensive to make, uh, like I said, because in in uh, F sharp it's a one liner and it generates a lot of code that you might as well need. Uh, in C sharp, uh, it's a lot more annoying to do that. It takes its own file to constructor, private field, method, um, and you know those are useful. Those are very useful to make, and why not use a tool set that enables you to do that and enables you to work productively while doing those best practices. Like in C Sharp, I feel you're penalized by, by doing the best practices. The, the tool set is, is not geared towards optimal development. So next point, F Sharp pattern matching is, this is a lot better. It's not composition or a stream concatenation. Um, so it's better than C Sharp pattern matching because there is a little bit of pattern matching in C Sharp, but I feel the API is a lot better, the, all the patterns you can make, and we haven't even talked about active patterns, which will just completely blow 
C sharp out of the water uh, for that. And we use pattern matching like all the time. So it's important to have a, a language that has a good pattern matching uh, abilities. Uh, so that's another con of C sharp. And lastly, and there's probably more I can make, but I just wanted to make this, you know, the, 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 high, the highlights. Uh, implicit, implicit, generics in C sharp. This just goes back to type inference. All the types you don't have to write. Um, and even though sometimes you add annotations for types in F sharp, a lot of the times you, you don't have to write them and it just makes everything a lot faster. Again, if you rename, or may not rename because you have tools for that, but uh, there's a lot of things that, that change when types are inferred and uh, implicit generics. It's just, you know, all the interfaces I made uh, is just completely annoying. Of course, um, if we're going to add constraints to generics in F-sharp, we have to use SRTPs. Um, so that's a, you know, I guess you could say it's a, um, it's not completely the same, uh, but in my case, I didn't have to use uh, constraints because I didn't, my, my functions were good enough. Like my function signatures were my abstractions. They weren't interfaces. So the generics that I was adding to the interfaces, uh, I had to add constraints because um, it, it's just different. It's just the way that I had to do it. So that was it for my breakdown of both implementations and the analysis. Uh, obviously I, was heavy on the F-sharp side in the sense that I, I prefer F-sharp. I think F-sharp is better. So of course my conclusion is gonna be that uh, the implementation was much more doable, readable, navigatable, and and uh, well, they're equally testable, I, I guess you could say. They have the same level of each unit is abstracted and they're ready for unit tests, but um, like I said, uh, it's a lot easier. I feel it's a lot easier to do so in F-sharp and these are the points which support my decision. Uh, if you have any pros and cons that you feel I missed, uh, you can go ahead and, and let me know in the comments. I'm really interested to hear your feedback. Uh, and I hope based on this analysis and hopefully your analysis of both projects, if you're gonna look into it yourself, hopefully you can take a decision that will lead you to mastering a, a, a language or tool set that, that you feel is better than, than the other. Obviously, they, they might have both, um, like if you're gonna do object-oriented, I don't, I don't personally, uh, I wouldn't personally write F-sharp for object-oriented. That's me, that's my opinion. I would probably use C-sharp instead, but I don't really write object-oriented code anymore. I write functional code, so I'm not gonna touch C-sharp uh, very often in the future. But that's that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope uh, this wasn't totally a C sharp bashing, but more a an interrogation, a, a an analysis. And if you want to check out the source code, it'll be linked in GitHub uh, down below. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you feel my analysis was fair, and you can subscribe for more content in the future, more F sharp content. So thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.